If you're into PC games running on DOS, it wouldn't get much better than the year 1996. We saw games such as Tomb Raider, Daggerfall, Civilization 2, Crusader, Red Alert, and Duke Nukem 3D all releasing in that same year. But there was one release from 1996 that would completely change video games. Quake is one of the most influential first-person shooters ever made. Its DNA is still in many a modern FPS, and even recently we would see a remaster 25 years later. Now, many of you already know about Quake and its history, and the story of John Carmack, John Romero, and the rest of the id Software team has already been discussed many times, and we are not revisiting that story here. In today's episode then, we are going to take a look at the underground piracy scene and how Quake would be one of the biggest scandals to ever rock that scene. If you've heard about scene groups such as Razor 1911, Prestige, Hybrid and Paradigm, then you'll be right at home here. And for those that haven't, don't worry. We'll explain what these groups are and how they operate. Since the earliest games were released on home computers in the late 70s, there existed individuals who wanted to make copies of those games, either individual backups to preserve the originals for safekeeping, or to distribute or sell to other people. This circumvention is known as software piracy. And game studios and publishers were well aware of this, of course, and started to introduce measures to stop duplication from occurring. Some of these methods we've covered before on the channel, including CD-based DRM, code wheels, fuzzy and weak bits, bad sectors on disk, dongle-based protection, the list goes on. There were many, many attempts to mitigate, and most of the time, these attempts failed. So while game publishers stepped up the fight against duplication, coordinated groups of teams known as scene or cracking groups would be formed, and they would acquire the release of a new game, remove its copy protection, also known as cracking, then release the game on bulletin boards worldwide and later on FTP servers. This process was not done by one individual. Suppliers in the group would source the game. Often, they would be able to get a hold of the game, usually before street dates. Then the crackers would remove the protection from the game and usually add an intro or what's known as a crack tro to let everyone know that they were first. Then the couriers would be responsible for spreading the release worldwide. Now it's a little more complicated than this, but this is usually how things worked. And while there was some honor and respect between these groups, the reality is your group wanted to beat the competition to see who could crack and release the game fastest. This release then would be available to the end user to download, install and run on their PCs. The scene would also have somewhat of a governing body known as the Software Pirates Association. They would be responsible for either allowing a release to go through to bulletin boards or to what's known as nuking, which is the removal of the release on all bulletin boards and FTP sites. There were two main rules when it came to scene group releases. First, no betas. Only a final retail release would be accepted. And second, the crack had to work properly. If it crashed on the PC or introduced any other side effects, then it would be fair game for another group to come in and win the release. If your group was first, your release would stand and everyone else's would be nuked. The competition was absolutely fierce. Due to the nature of these scene groups and what they were doing, there was always that risk of being raided by the feds. This meant that the groups would use aliases and scene names rather than their individual names. They would communicate on group only IRC servers. Most of the time, the public never had any insight as to how these groups ran and how many members, for example, were in each group. They would mostly communicate via .nfo files. A .nfo file is a text file that was accompanied with a scene group release. This one here, for example, was done by the group Fairlight. They usually contain some notes about the release, how to install it, and optionally some group informational greetings. And then you would not hear about that group again until the next game. Nineteen ninety six's release of Quake would be one game that would be hotly contested by every scene group that was around. Who could supply crack and release Quake first? 
This would result in some serious street cred and respect. Quake was easily the biggest release of the year and certainly the most anticipated. Any group that got their hands on Quake first would have a place at the table with heavyweights like Razer 1911 and Prestige. In 1995, a new release group entered the scene and quickly rose up the ranks to become very popular and established. The group's name was ROR, which stood for Release on Rampage. The leader, Ash Asvilden, had the scene name TKLP, which was short for That Crazy Little Punk. TKLP was already in various scene groups before ROR and had good connections to suppliers and crackers. And when ROR went into 1996, they were going in full of momentum. Around the same time, id Software released QTest. It was a way for players to test out the deathmatch features of Quake as sort of a public beta test for the release. While buggy, it was also very popular and was used by many until the official shareware release of Quake at the end of June in 1996. But it would be 11 days before shareware Quake release when a full version of Quake was leaked to the internet. This was confirmed by id Software to be what was known as Beta 3 and while close to the official retail release, contains some differences. But since it contains the entire game, including all campaigns, it was clearly software piracy. On June 21st, 1996, one day before Quake's official release, ROR would release the retail version of Quake, beating out all other release groups for the crown. The NFO file celebrated ROR's victory. Here it is, the Duke 3D killer, brought to you just like expected by ROR 1996. But Cena's quickly realized there was something up with this release. It ended up being the exact same file size as the Beta 3 leak, and the version contained the same readme file indicating that it was a pre-release. However, it would have some changes in its executable, notably wording changes, and the biggest difference is that the word Beta was completely stripped out. But even still, something fell off. When pressed on the matter, TKLP said the following. Well, it's the final pre-release. The difference between ours and the actual final that will be in stores is we don't have the 400 megs of music, no modem play, and you can't hack up dead bodies. Without anyone else's word, this seemed like a plausible explanation. After all, this was the full release of Quake. ROR claimed that Quake was supplied to them by an inside man that they had working at id Software. And this should have been the end of the story. TKLP had convinced the scene that this was the final release of Quake, and the release stood firm. But the release would be anything but final. What had actually occurred was TKLP had taken the Beta 3 leak, stripped out the word Beta completely from the executable, and repackaged it, uploaded it to bulletin boards, and labelled the release as final under the ROR name in an attempt to win the race to see who could release Quake first. And he almost got away with it, except id Software themselves would stop him dead in his tracks. Jay Wilbur, who worked at id Software at the time, confirmed that the ROR release was actually a repackaged Beta 3 leak and inadvertently exposed TKLP for faking the release as final by manipulating the executable. Word on the street is that you may be the source of the Quake 3 beta leak. My sources tell me that you and I are friends and the reason why you have the beta of Quake is that you work for a magazine. One, I don't even know you. Two, its software does not send beta copies of games to any magazines. This would be enough for the scene to take notice and nuke the ROR Quake release and label it as fake. many of the major bulletin boards and FTP sites decided to pull together and blacklist all future ROR releases, effectively shutting down the group. And remember that we talked about the SPA, the Software Piracy Association. Well, that group voted unanimously to ban all ROR releases from all sites that were participating in it. ROR disbanded and reformed as a new group known as Reflux and TKLP would lead that group and learn from his mistakes. But the race to release the final release of Quake was still on, and in the end, a smaller group known as Core Dump would beat out heavyweights Razer 1911 for the release. 
Razer would release their own version of Quake, which was identical to the core dump version. And many argued that Razer duped on the release. Duping is a term that means taking someone else's release and repackaging it as your own. In the end, going against regular scene rules, both versions were allowed to stay. Some core dump members insisted that Razer had duped and argued that most site operators don't have the quote balls to delete a Razer release. In the end, the 1996 Quake pre-release beta scandal is one of the most infamous in scene history. TKLP, whose real name is Ashed Vielsen, runs a very successful record label these days, Sumerian Records. But the story of Quake and the underground scene groups will never be forgotten. And even as recently as 2011, Torrent Freak ran an article about Ed Vilsen confirming his past as a member of ROR. But that will do it for today's episode. And if you like these tales of the underground scene groups, let me know in the comments below. There's plenty of others that I can definitely share with you guys going forward. But for now, we are going to leave it here for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to put a like on it. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.